God be the glory. Eight. Good morning. Hey, let's all stand up and let's grab our hymn books and turn to page eight. To God be the glory. We'll give you a couple seconds to find it. <laughs> page eight. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender, who truly believes, that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Pray with me. Oh, God, we have come to this place, Lord, to lift your name on high, Lord, to praise your name, Lord, to be a blessing to you, Lord, as we gather together in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. And Lord, thank you that you deign to meet with us, Lord, a bunch of people out in the middle of nowhere, and Lord, you are here, Lord, by your Spirit, Lord. I am never ceased to amaze, be amazed, Lord, how it is that you are present with your people when we gather Lord, thank you. Thank you for meeting with us, Lord. Receive, Lord, our praises to you today, we pray, Lord, that you would be exalted, Lord, that you would be pleased, Lord, with what transpires in this room, Lord, for the next hour, hour and a half, whatever it is, Lord. We just want you to be lifted high, Lord. <clears throat> and as we do that, Lord, we are reminded of our place. Lord, you are the creator Lord, we are the created ones. And so, Lord, we come cognizant of that, Lord, that you are the sovereign one, Lord, that you are the one who is in control over all things, and we are not. 
or so many times we try to control what goes on in, in our world and in, in our little sphere of influence. And truth be told, Lord, we have trouble controlling ourselves. But thank you, Lord, in spite of all appearances, you are on your throne. We take great comfort in that, Lord, <clears throat> because, Lord, we do get distracted at times and wonder, where is all this going? But, Lord, you have a great story of redemption, Lord, and you are moving that story forward, and it has an incredible ending for those who are in Christ, Lord. And so, Lord, we trust you, Lord. We come again to declare that, Lord, even as we sing these songs, that we trust you, Lord, that you've got this. We don't have to. We commit to following you today, Lord Jesus, to walking in your ways. And Lord, that is enough for today. Lord, as we begin, <clears throat> we just want to take a moment to get, get stuff off of our chest, Lord. Because Lord, as much as we desire to follow you, Jesus, as much as we are committed to doing that, Lord, sometimes we find ourselves off the road and in the ditch. Lord, how does that happen? So, Lord, we're just going to take a moment to confess our sins before you. It's nothing that you don't know, that we've not loved you perfectly. Lord, we, <clears throat> we have not loved one another perfectly. And so, Lord, we are going to agree with what you already know in these prayers of confession. So, Lord, would you bend your ear our way, Lord, to hear these prayers in these quiet moments. Father, we are so grateful that as we confess our sins, Lord, you are faithful and Lord, you are just and you will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Oh God, you are a good, good father and we are loved by you. Lord, today it's Father's Day and Lord, we celebrate you. Lord, we celebrate you as our father every day. Well, Lord, today we kind of turn our attention a little bit to earthly fathers and Lord, give thanks, Lord, for our earthly fathers Lord, I pray that for those who are fathers in this room today, Lord, <clears throat> that you'd give them strength and, and perseverance, give them courage, Lord, that they might shepherd their kids, young or adult, Lord, doesn't matter, that you would just give them words to speak and wisdom, Lord, to, to shepherd those lives, Lord, in, in your ways, Lord. And Lord, <clears throat> some didn't have very good fathers. And Lord, because of that, their, their, their view of you is, is clouded. And so, Lord, I pray today that by your spirit, you would give them a clearer view of who you are. Lord, <clears throat> that the, the hurt that they have experienced at the hands of an earthly father, whether living or no longer living, Lord, would not cloud their perception of you. And Lord, you would shine brightly and reveal yourself in even greater ways and show them that you are a good, good father and that they are dearly loved by you. So, Spirit, would you just rule and reign in this place today? We need you. Oh, Lord, we need you. Every hour, we need you. Thank you that you are up to the task. Praise the Lord, we say, in Jesus' name. Would you say amen with me? Amen. amen. You may be seated. Greg Fisher has a a testimony he would like to share with us. So, Greg, if you'd come join me up front here. Sorry, I'm taking up some of the little available time I have because I was back there ushering. I almost had to run. Anyway. Praise God, Kathy and I got to see God working hugely. Some of you know I wasn't here last week, and uh, Dennis occasionally says, anybody have a God sighting? Last, the Friday before this, I uh, almost had an eye-to-eye -eye God sighting because uh, 
the way I got to make this concise. Hard for me. I like to visit and blab. Anyway, uh, out in my workshop, I'd been restoring batteries and uh, had about an inch of uh, battery acid, sulfuric acid, sitting in a bottle. I thought, boy, you don't want to drink this. It's dangerous, even though it's clear. So I wrote on it. Apparently, not well enough because Friday before last, I was finishing a little job decided to uh, that I was thirsty. I saw that sitting there. Somehow, unforgetfulness or anyway. So I grabbed that bottle, took a big gulp. Part of it went down. I knew instantly, no, you've done something not right. So I got a hold of Kathy up in the house. I was uh, spitting, drinking a little water, trying to dilute it. And then I, God, gave me the wisdom to realize I did not want to dilute it. I wanted to uh, de-energize it. What's the word? Neutralize it. Sorry. So she came down, made me a couple cups of bacon soda. I drank them quickly, and that had the desired effect. And I hope none of you ever need to uh, go through that effect. Anyway, so I got a flight to the hospital. I was there four days doing all kinds of tests. My throat, esophagus, all that was totally inflamed and burned somewhat. And, but, even though God might have allowed Satan to think he could kill me, God turned it totally around. You know, we have an enemy that once seeks to destroy, steal, and kill. And maybe God gave him that chance. I, I don't know all the theology anyway. God turned it around, and we had, Kathy and I both had an amazing week at the hospital. We just answered questions to doctors, one trained in India that came over and said, what in the world did you do that for? I told him I wanted to save $150 by re-energizing some ATV batteries, and he said, you have any idea what all this is going to cost you? But, you know, sense of humor and the Spirit of God, and he just impressed us with love for everybody so much that we got, God's Spirit was with us all week, and we got to witness to people, and we got to pray with nurses and people, and uh, I'm forgetting what else I was going to say, but it does need to be short anyway. God's there, and uh, we. I thank you very, very much for all the prayers of everybody here. I'm still on a soft food diet, diet, uh, but my voice is back. Thank you very, very much for your prayers. Thank Pastor uh, Dennis for allowing me a, a minute to testify that uh, it's amazing when the Spirit of the Lord is on you for a while and you know that God has saved you from a severe attack of the enemy. We just answered questions about, well, how did you two meet this or that? Kathy handed out at least half a dozen of her little pamphlets on how she was a uh, heroin addict for 10 years to all kinds of nurses and people in the hospital. And uh, anyway, you know, some things like this, in my opinion, if you can see the results of what God does and how he uses you without you doing any effort because it's all the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, when you see that happen, I've thought to myself, you know, I wouldn't mind going through this. This was not a problem for the result that Almighty God got through it. Today is a special day, and it's bigger than we think, because there are many different kinds of fathers and they all need to be recognized and honored today. 
Today, we honor those fathers who consistently strive to balance loving their wives and children with being good, godly workers at their jobs. May you feel the pleasure of God. Today, we honor those dads who had poor fathers themselves, but who have committed never to become the father they grew up under. May your children continue to be guarded from any of the hurt you carry. Today, we honor the fathers who are older and who no longer have day-to-day -day obligations to their own children. May the family gatherings this weekend make you feel like you could do it all over again. Today, we honor the adult children of fathers who were absent. May the God of the fatherless become your father in ways you've only dreamed of. And may you believe with your whole heart that his leaving wasn't your fault. Today, we honor men who have no children of their own, but who father younger men as mentors and guides. May you see your important roles as impacting and life-changing. And finally today, we honor fathers who have passed away. May their good deeds live on through you and may their careless deeds be corrected in your lifetime. Today is a special day. So for all the fathers we mentioned and even those we didn't, be honored, be blessed, and be joyful. We believe that you have what it takes to change the world and you're doing it one relationship at a time. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, you guys. Now, God gave me the privilege of having three daughters, and uh, I just praise him for that, and that... Uh, you know, a couple of them, or almost all of them, are in their 50s, and which is hard to believe. It doesn't didn't happen. So, but one thing they all had in common was uh, Dickey Lake Bible Camp. They all went through Dickey Lake Bible Camp. They all served at Dickey Lake Bible Camp, and uh, it is an important place, and it's just down the road. And uh, we could use some counselors out there, some helpers, uh, anything that you can do. I'm sure Zach would be happy to have you out there for a while, a day or a week or whatever you can spare. Just uh, see Zach if you have any questions or anything about that. And then there's a online uh, application that uh, needs to be filled out. But if you got questions, See Zach. There's a list of the camps and uh, retreats in the bulletin. Um, you know, a lot of grandparents uh, scholarship their kids to the camp out there, and uh, that's a that's a good good way to get kids out there. If you know of any other children in the community that would uh, like to go to camp. Please get them registered out there, or at least give Zach the names and and uh, get them out there, because it's it's a great time and a great time for the Lord to work in their lives. I've uh, got a blood drive here at the church on the twenty uh, fifth of July. Uh, there's this. You can go online and make an appointment. Uh, so you don't have to sit around and watch the blood dripping on the floor and stuff like that. So so if you would like to, or you can, give blood, um, get a hold of the people and get an appointment. Baptisms are, have, have, <laughs> baptisms are happening the 4th of September out at the Bible camp. Uh, just know that the lake is at its maximum temperature at that time, so there's no no problem with jumping in. It 
and it's a good time out there when we have this uh, baptism services and stuff. It's a great time. Okay, if we could have the uh, ushers come forward. Let's go ahead and pray as the ushers are coming. Father, we, uh, we just thank you today for uh, being our Father, uh, knowing us intimately and personally, Lord, and us, you. We just thank you for that. We thank you that uh, we have this opportunity to give back to you and just pray that you bless it and use it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get our hymn books and turn to page 54. <clears throat> you notice we got a couple of new ladies up here singing. So Miss Holly and Miss Sue, and they came up and joined me this morning, so I'm glad to have them up here.
Lord, we once again come into your presence, Lord, just asking your spirit to freely move among us, Lord. We pray that everything that we say and do here this morning would be a sweet sound in your ear. And God, I just pray that you just add your blessing to the service today. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, let's do page 340. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered, not his blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. All else to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So the scripture this morning is Hebrews 4, 11 through 16 says, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's turn to page 16. Oh, 
break the heart. Then sink my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods and forest fades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God is son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross I put and gladly buried, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come, He shall acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Just tell God how great he is. Just, oh, God, thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What you've done, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, you are so great, you can change the destiny of a person, Lord. We are born with a default setting. We are going to hell, to condemnation. And yet, Lord, you sent your own son on a rescue mission. That's how great you are, to die for sinners like us, that our destiny could be changed from eternal condemnation to eternal life in and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you have done, Lord. We couldn't possibly save ourselves. Only you could save us. We thank you that you have done that and set us on the right path. Thank you that you've given us your spirit to, to be our, our compass, to guide us and to, to lead us and to pray for us. You're a great God. We love you. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
I'm not actually having you turn anywhere in, in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you just a barrage of, of scriptures. So uh, in, in your bulletin, though, there is a uh, kind of an insert. <clears throat> it's the Apostles' Creed in the Bible. I'll get to that in a minute. It was probably six, seven, eight years ago I read a, a book. It's written by a guy by the name of Gordon T. Smith. He is a uh, kind of the dean of the seminary, uh, Ambrose Seminary, I think it's called, in Calgary. That is a, a Christian and Missionary Alliance school. It's also kind of partnered with the, the Nazarenes, so it's kind of an odd thing, I guess. But anyhow, I've read a lot of his books. This book that I read was called Evangelical... I didn't write it down. Uh, Lord... Remind me of this evangelical, sacramental, and Pentecostal, and why the church should be all three. I don't have that a picture of it or anything like that. And I, I, it really caught my attention because I have been in all of those church traditions. I've been a part of all of them, and I, I, I love all of those. And his point was that the church should be all of those things. You know, evangelicals are... <clears throat> want to proclaim the, the good news about Jesus, they tend to be very uh, Bible-centered. And sometimes they can be Jesus only to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit, so they can get off track that way. Sacramental churches are, are very much about the, the table, the, Lord, the Lord's Supper, and uh, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper, baptism, and, and other things. But just uh, how, how God works his, his grace through some of those, those tangible things. And then Pentecostal churches are very much focused on the Holy Spirit, sometimes to the exclusion of other things, so they can get off to this direction. But, but I've been in all of those, and for me as a, as a pastor, in, in leading a, a body, and you probably recognize this, I, I like to blend all of those things together because I think that's what the church is. If, if you leave something out, I think you're missing something. So th this, this week and, and next week, I'm going to be talking about a couple of creeds. This week, the Apostles' Creed, next week, the Nicene Creed. Now, some of you are going, yeah, I, I grew up in my church. We read those and recited those things all the time. Others of you are going, huh? Uh, maybe maybe not. I don't know. And maybe some of you are weirded out that we would even do that. But it's safe, okay? It's safe. <clears throat> Anyhow, what do you believe? Has anybody asked you what you believe about Christianity? Have they come and said, well, you know, Tell me what this Christianity thing is, is all about. And maybe your temptation has been to say, take them down the Romans road or something like that. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, you know, that's fine. But your evangelicalism may be showing a little bit there. But it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Man. Uh. But, you know, if you've never really thought about what it is you believe as a Christian, it's pretty hard to maybe tell somebody else what you really believe about Christianity and what, what Christians have believed really for millennia. And the other thing is, do you believe rightly? Which implies that you can believe wrongly, which you can believe wrongly. That's known as heterodoxy or heresy particularly if you start pushing that. And the problem with that is that your actions follow what you believe. I was just interviewing uh, me and, and Jim uh, Davey, our sister church in um, Kalispell. He and I are on the Licensing, Ordination, and Consecration Council for the Rocky Mountain District. And yesterday we were interviewing a guy who would like to come back into the alliance. He had been part of a, a church plant and... He left because they went off the rails in terms of theology. They were starting to promote things that were not orthodox because that's what right belief is, orthodoxy. And so there is a danger of getting off the rails. And Christian orthodoxy is really what the church has believed for millennia, the very foundational things. Now, orthodoxy does not mean that we cannot have different opinions about disputable matters. You know, things like end times and uh, baptisms and things like that, okay? So we can, we can dispute and, and talk about those things and have arguments, but there are some certain things that are, the, these are not up for negotiation. These are the bedrock of what Christianity is. 
in the first century church, and in that, the, you know, in the first century church, there, there was heresy. There was wrong beliefs. There was wrong thinking. One of the heresies was something called Ebionism, and it was promoted by a group. Uh, they were a Jewish Christian group called the Ebionites, and uh, they, they believed that Jesus was a mere man, okay? And by his scrupulous obedience to the Jewish law, he was justified to be declared in the right by God and made the Messiah. So they didn't believe that he was God. Anybody have a problem with that? I hope you all will, right? So they didn't believe in the virgin birth. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so John, who wrote the last of our Gospels, it may be that in his writing that, maybe he's thinking of countering some of this heresy. We, we don't know. We can't see that far back. There's just not enough evidence. But one verse from John 20, verse 31, he says, but these are written so that you may, guess what, believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. There it is. He's the Son of God. And if he's the Son of God, that means he is deity. He is He's been the Son of God from, from all eternity, and we'll talk more about that, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, another heresy in the first century was something called docetism. That comes from uh, the Greek word meaning to seem, and basically these people said Jesus only seemed to be a man. So they were kind of at the other side of the pendulum. They were in the right ditch, whereas the Ebionites were in the left ditch of the road or whatever. And so they said Jesus must have been, he was kind of like a phantom or a ghost or something like that. He wasn't a real man. I mean, how could, how could he be? Except John wrote this. He says in John 19, he says, in, so this is when Jesus is on the cross, he's dead. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. I don't know that ghosts or spirits bleed. Right? Or you'd have no need to stick him in the side with a spear. How could you even, right? And then he says, the man who saw it has given testimony, and this testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. Toward the end of the first century and into the beginning of the second century, so around 100 that year, there was a kind of a more ambitious heresy known as Gnosticism. And that, that word comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means a, a belief or, or knowledge, knowledge, not belief. And uh, there was lots of different strains of Gnostics, and but one thing they shared in common was uh, that only some people possess special knowledge of the true way of life. And and there's there's Gnostics out in our world today. In fact, all of these heresies, you can probably find a group today that will, believes that same heresy, and so they are really disqualifying themselves from being part of the Christian family. The Gnostics were very dualistic. They, they believed two, two things which were kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. Spiritual things were good and pure. Physical or material things were inherently evil, okay? That's, that's what they believed, and so salvation was really all about liberating a person's spirit from this evil material world, okay? And the God of creation, the God that, that we worship, he must have been an inferior deity who was prone to mischief-making. Because why? Because he made physical stuff. And so if you're a Gnostic and physical stuff is bad, well, this God that we worship, the God who created all things, he must be a troublemaker, and, of course, you couldn't believe that Jesus would be a human. Well, I, I've appealed to the, the New Testament, a couple of verses in John, with regard to those first two heresies, but that's easy for me to do. But around the year 100, you couldn't just pick up a Bible. There was beginning to be some, some consensus about what we look at in our New Testament, these writings, they were all existing by that time. But there wasn't like uh, an idea of a, a canon, what we call our New Testament canon. It would take another 300 years before the church finally agreed on all that. And there was a good consensus about what was authentic and what would be followed, but, but they couldn't just pick that up. We, we take some of those things for granted. 
nearly uh, near the end of the second century, Christianity had spread ar around the, the Mediterranean region. This, this purple stuff, you can't see the small writing, but it says that's by the time of Irenaeus, who was a, a church leader, uh, 185 AD. So it's around 200. So you had uh, Christians here, 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 here at Rome. And in those regions, you had somebody who oversaw multiple churches. That person was a bishop. And so there was a bishop of Carthage, bishop of Alexandria, Alexandria, bishop of Antioch, Ephesus, a bishop in Rome. There was more than that, but those are some of the, the, the major ones. Interesting what happened in the Roman church, that they, they began to, to put together a, a creed. And a creed is, this is what we believe. And we know that is the old Roman creed. It was probably assembled around 140, and it was for baptismal candidates. So if you were going to be baptized, you had to agree and profess this old Roman creed. And I wonder if we might do that together aloud. I believe in God Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was buried, and the third day rose from the dead, who ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father whence he comes to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, the life everlasting. So a creed like that is really a summary of basic Christian beliefs, orthodox beliefs. This is what we believe, and this is the things that the church has really believed from, from the beginning. You might call it a, a, a statement of faith. Roll the clock ahead, maybe another 100 years or something to, like that, and this old Roman creed, creed, really it was kind of the bones for what became known as the Apostles' Creed. So it was added to, and it wasn't that the apostles wrote it, but it was based upon the teaching of the apostles. It wasn't Holy Scripture, inspired Scripture, but it was taken from Holy Scripture, oftentimes word for word from the scripture. And it was used by the church that says, this is what we believe. And baptismal candidates would have to agree to that and confess that. But it also served as a measuring stick, so to speak, so you could detect heresy. So you could easily detect, this is wrong teaching. And it, it, it was put together in a fairly memorable way so that you could, oh, okay, I can memorize this and and, and spew it out. There's a, a danger in that, but nevertheless, what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at all the pieces of the, the Apostles' Creed. Some of you have memorized this. How many of you memorized the Apostles' Creed ever? You were in that kind of a church tradition. Yeah, me too. Me too. So we're going to look at it um, line by line, as I say, and we're going to look at some scripture. And the, the handout that was in the bulletin, it's got the Apostles' Creed in the left column, and then a whole bunch of scripture references. I, I found this thing online, and uh, I went through all the scripture references and added some, took some out, because I didn't think they really supported what they were saying. But uh, anyhow, so that is for your uh, enjoyment and uh, your home study. So the first line is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, which sounds kind of like the old Roman creed sounded. God the Father. If God is a father, it implies that there is what? A son, right? And Peter declares this in, in his first letter. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has always, eternally, he has been the Father. Eternally. There was never a time when he was not the Father, like there was never a time when Jesus was not the Son. We need to understand that. But he is God the Father. He is almighty. It means he's omnipotent, right? He is all-powerful. He can do all things, and we see that throughout the scriptures. One that I picked up here is uh, in, when Jesus was telling the disciples, he says, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like it's hard to, as hard as it is to get a, a camel through the eye of a needle, and the disciples say, well, we're toast, man. We're toast. And Jesus says, Jesus looked at them and said, 
with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. The creed declares that God, the Father, is the creator of heaven and earth. We know that from the beginning, right? In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And we see people declaring, particularly in the Psalms, that God had created all things. We, we understand that. The uh, apostles in Acts chapter 4, they said the same thing in their prayer to God. They said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. It was standard Christian belief that God created everything. God made it all. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, what does he say about the creation? I don't have this verse up there, but the creation testifies that God is. The creation, you look around and it screams that there is a God, an intelligent designer who created all this stuff. It didn't just happen. Then the creed shifts to the second person of the Godhead. Now, when I say second person, is that a, a derogatory term? Does that mean Jesus is subordinate to the Father? That would be heresy, actually. The, the term second member of the Godhead and third member for the Holy Spirit, that came a guy by the name of Justin Martyr. I think he was in the second century. He came up with that terminology. It doesn't mean that anybody is any better or any greater in the Godhead. They're all, and we'll talk about this more next week, but they are all the same stuff. Uzios. Substance, essence. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Did you know that? <laughs> right? It's the Greek word. It, it, it means anointed one. It, it's the same as the Hebrew word mesh, uh, Mashiach, which is Messiah, in, in transliterated into English. And that means that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the king of the Jews. That's what that Christ, that, uh, that title is means he is the only son. Better, he's the only begotten son. More on this next week. He's the only begotten son of the Father. But he is, again, there was never a time when Jesus was not the son. He is eternally begotten of the Father. When Jesus asked the disciples one day uh, in Matthew 16, he says, you know, who, who, who are people saying that I am? Jesus is trying to get a pulse on what's going on out there in the Jewish community. And then he says to the disciples, who do you guys say that I am? And what does Peter say? You are the Christ or you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's the declaration. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. What does Lord mean? That's a hard one for us because in, in our culture, we don't have Lord so much, do we? But it's, it's a master, it's the king, it's the top dog, it's the boss, if you will. On that day of Pentecost, when Peter stands up and under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, he preaches this incredible sermon. He says this, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Both Lord and Messiah. And isn't that the fundamental confession of the Christian faith? Romans 10, 9, what does that say? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, all right. So we believe that, don't we? That Jesus is Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Even though Jesus has been the Son of God from all eternity, in order for him to come as the rescuer for humanity, he had to be in flesh, right, incarnated. He had to take on human flesh. And the only way that was going to work was, and, and who but God could figure this out, was for God himself to impregnate this Virgin Mary. How does that work? I, I can't explain it, but I do know this, that the God who created all things, is anything impossible for him? Yeah, small potatoes for him. Mary was having a hard time understanding, though, Gabriel, the angel, when he came and said, hey, you're going to be pregnant and you're going to give birth to the son of David and blah, blah, blah. Mary asks a very valid question. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And so you want to have a God-man? That's how you do it. <clears throat> 
Okay, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. All of the Gospels spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' passion, what his, his suffering that last week. And, and in all the Gospels, time slows down. Jesus' public ministry was probably, what, three years? And that one week of time is probably, a, I didn't really look, but a quarter to a third of those Gospels. Time slows down. The Gospel writers wanted us to really have the full impact of what is happening here. This is from John, uh, his rendering of it, John 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. That sounds like suffering to me. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them, the, the Roman troops, uh, to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, right? The Roman soldiers, they were experts in people being dead. That's what they did. They made dead people. So, so they knew, and then right after that they, comes that part, that line, where they stuck him in the side with a spear. And then uh, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Who was they? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, right? And so they, he wasn't buried like we think of buried, but he was put in a kind of a vault, a, a, a crypt, you might say. Now, then it says, he descended to the dead. Now, this is the only disputed line of the creed, I would say. Some versions of it say he descended to hell, which it's not right. Um, in Hebrew, Sheol, if you look in the Psalms, you'll see Sheol is there a lot. That's the place of the dead. It's kind of the waiting place of the dead, waiting for the final judgment. The Greek rendering of that is Hades. Hell is the lake of fire in uh, Revelation 20. So the, the idea is that, that Jesus descended to the dead in some church traditions. Uh, the, the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday is Holy Saturday. And in, in church tradition, uh, and, and many Christian traditions believe this, that, that Jesus went and he uh, preached the gospel to those faithful Jews who were in this holding pen, Sheol, so that they could come to faith in him. And it kind of fits with a number of passages, although there's no passage in the Bible that directly says this exactly. But in Romans 3.25, it says uh, that, that God... Uh, Ah, I can't I remember this. It, it, it's, I know, but some of the sin, I know, but somewhere it's in here too, that, that God left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And so the, the idea is that those sins that were committed by the faithful Jews, they were unpunished waiting for Jesus to go make this proclamation. So there's verses that kind of hint at this, like uh, 1 Peter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. And then it continues, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. So that would seem like, okay, he went and preached to those in the days of Noah. Peter has more to say about it in uh, chapter 4 of his first letter. He says, For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. You know, you could read that, though, that he preached to those who are now dead, that when they were alive, they received the gospel message, but now they are dead. So people are divided on this. Interpreters are not sure, and in fact, when I was in the Methodist church where I learned this creed, it didn't have that line. Anybody else a Methodist at one time? Yeah. So that's a new line, right? Clyde and Cheryl, do, do the Methodists have that line in there now? No, they still don't do they? No. Okay. So it's, it's disputed. But this one is not disputed. On the third day, he rose again. Jesus' resurrection is the foundation of our Christian hope, right? Jesus is alive today. He conquered death. He came out of the tomb on the third day. Here's Luke's uh, account 
of it. Well, it's actually the uh, angels speaking to the, the women who were at the tomb. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians, he's, he's confronting heresy because they say, well, the dead aren't raised. That's stupid. And he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. A couple verses later, he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Then he ascended into heaven, right, the ascension. And it seems like we don't talk about the ascension a lot in Protestantism, it seems like, but it's very much a real thing, and it's, it's an important part of where Jesus resides today, which is the next line. But Luke records it in the very last chapter of Luke's gospel and then in the first, uh, first chapter of uh, his writing, uh, the book of Acts. This is from Luke 24. When he, that would be Jesus, had led them, which would be the disciples, out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And now, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Jesus is enthroned at the Father's right hand, isn't he? What does he do there? He is ruling and reigning today. Paul talks about that in, in Romans chapter 8. And this is uh, from Acts 7, which is Stephen sees him. See, Jesus is still embodied as he is at the Father's right hand. Stephen sees Jesus. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And he will come to judge the living and the dead or what was the old King James, the quick and the dead? Do you feel quick? John, do you feel quick today? <laughs> uh, uh, Peter, when he's going to visit Cornelius at his house, he says this, he commanded, Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus is returning as the judge. Then it uh, shifts from talking about Jesus, and the bulk of the creed talks about Jesus. And then it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a number of different names, doesn't he? He is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of Christ. He's the Spirit of truth. He's other names as well. He's the third person of the Godhead. He's so important. Do never neglect the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this in John 14. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit. What is advocate? Some of your translations say helper. Some say counselor. Some say a comforter. The Greek word is parakletos, paraclete. It, it's, it, it's a word that you can't translate directly into English. But a few verses before this, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will send another parakletos. So Jesus is like the first parakletos and now the Spirit is the next one. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Have you ever had the Spirit remind you of something? Like when Dennis is up here trying to remember what that verse is, oh Lord, okay, here it comes. Uh, Jesus himself said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then that day of Pentecost, they were baptized with the Spirit and power. Here's the most confusing or misunderstood line, the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic is, is a word that means universal, or I wrote another meaning, according to the whole. You've, you've got to remember, so this is early, this is before the Roman Catholic Church. Got that? The Roman Catholic Church was not a thing. There was a church in Rome, but it wasn't what we think of today as the uh, Roman Catholic Church. So it's holy. It's set apart for God. It is Catholic. It's universal. We are part of the church universal. And it's the church, the uh, 
the ecclesia, those who are called out by God, those who have the spirit of God dwelling inside of them. They are part of this. Uh, there is one church, right? Uh, the um, I got the wrong sheet. <clears throat> Paul writes to the, the Corinthians in his second letter. He starts like this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people, some of your translations would say saints, throughout Achaia. So this church is a big thing. It's interesting, in Eastern Orthodoxy, they say that when the their ch local church body meets, that the whole church is there. It's an interesting concept to, to think about. The communion of saints is another thing that is a belief. Communion means, it comes from the Greek word koinonia to mean fellowship. Saints are not dead people, right? It's believers. We are saints. Hagios is the Greek word, means holy ones. Uh, Acts 2.42, right after 3,000 come to faith, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to koinonia, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The creed also says, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Aren't you glad? Amen. Amen. I was going to go off on a side note, but I'm not going to. Jesus was the final sacrifice for sin, right? He is sin offering. And through his coming as in, in the likeness of sinful flesh, Paul says in Romans 8, he came as a sin offering and he condemned sin in the flesh. Paul wrote in Colossians, he says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Are you alive with Christ? Yes. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. We believe in the resurrection of the body. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> this is our resurrection. Those who the, the faithful in Christ will be raised to what? To life. All will be raised. John chapter 5 and go to Revelation 20 as well. All the dead will be raised, but the, those who are raised who are in Christ will be raised to eternal life. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the resurrection chapter. He says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And do you believe in the life everlasting? Amen. Amen. And that life everlasting, that life eternal, which is the life of the age to come, it begins when? Today when you trust in Jesus. You are new creations in Christ. The new creation has begun in you when the Spirit is indwelling you. Jesus, or John put it like this, and this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You know, we are part of a free church tradition. That means you don't have to tithe. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are part of a free church tradition as part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and there's a lot of Protestant traditions that are free church, and that means they don't subscribe to the early church councils. And I'll talk about those, some of those councils next week. But, uh, and so in, in free churches, oftentimes they, they will never recite a creed because they say, well, that's not scripture. Hopefully, maybe you are convinced that the creed came from scripture. And in fact, most of it is just a quote right from scripture, but it is a concise summary of what scripture says. Maybe some of you are, are not convinced, but the problem is some of us in our free church tradition, we can do this and look down on those. Oh, we don't do that. We could have the Bible. It's from the Bible. You know what we have? We have a statement of faith. Guess what a statement of faith is? A creed. If you go online, cmalliance.org, the Alliance Statement of Faith, what the Alliance believes about God. And what, what does the Alliance believe? 
There is one God who is infinite and perfect, existing eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the true God and the true man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Where have I heard that before? The Holy Spirit is a divine person, and so on. It's not that we don't have creeds. We do have a creed. We don't call it a creed, because that would be anathema to some, I guess, to call something a creed. And then there are some who are worried that if we recite a creed, we might become too Catholic. Would it be a bad thing to join with every Christian church tradition, whether it's Protestant, whether it's Roman Catholic, whether it would be Eastern Orthodox and agree that these are the things that we believe. This is what makes us a body of believers. This is what makes us Christian. But I, I know people get weirded out about creeds. A Southern Baptist, their free church, we were a couple, two or three years in a Southern Baptist church, never heard anything about a creed. Albert Moeller, he said this, all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, but none can believe less. A creed like this serves as guardrails. This, this is Orthodox Christianity. Get outside of here and you got problems. You're going to be a heretic. And there's been lots of heretics. Jesus' half-brother Jude, he seemed to think stuff like this is important. Here's what he says in, in uh, verse 3 of Jude. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's people. You know, the creed doesn't contain all the Christian doctrines, but it contains foundational ones. It contains ones that all Christians believe. Maybe not he descended to the dead, but... But it's basically a very concise thing of this is a listing of what we believe. Back in the, the third century, so this would be in the 200s, there was a guy by the name of Paul of Samoseta. I don't know how you pronounce that. That's a town. Uh, he ended up being the bishop of Antioch for about eight years. Antioch was the place where the church sent Paul and Barnabas out on missionary journeys, right? So it was kind of a, a big thing uh, to be part of Antioch. And so he was overseeing all the churches in Antioch. But Paul kind of got outside of the guardrails. He said Jesus' divinity derived from his special relationship with God that began at his baptism. This guy is a leader in the church. Today we call that uh, heresy adoptionism. It's kind of like Jesus was adopted. He became the son of when he was baptized? No, Jesus has always been the son, eternally. And so the other bishops in the area, they said, you know, we, we hear what this guy is teaching. And so they gathered together in Antioch in the year 268. And they all picked up the New Testament. They, they had the writings but they also had that creed. And what does the creed say? I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, God's only Son. This is heresy. And he ended his tenure as bishop over Antioch that very year. Next week we'll talk about the Trinity and how the early church really wrestled with what the Trinity is and how heresy so often caused the church to think deeply about what they believed. What do you believe? Have you ever thought deeply about some of these things? This is what I believe. If somebody comes up to you and says, what do you Christians believe? Do you give them the Roman road? And again, that's not a bad thing, but there's so much more that we believe. And the Apostles' Creed, whatever you might think about it, is a nice summary. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Lord, our only, his only begotten Son, and so on. Uh, we're going to recite this together, but it's a little different than I, I learned it because there's a few different uh, versions of it. But th the faith that's expressed here Christians through the ages, some died for this. 
not for the creed, but this is what they believed and they would not recant. And so they were burned at the stake because they believed this stuff. Do we believe this stuff, these truths in the same way? Are we orthodox in our Christian beliefs? Let's, why don't you stand? And let's recite this together. And it'll be a little different maybe than you're used to. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what we believe is so important because, Lord, what we believe shapes what we do. Remember that, that great saint, A.W. Tozer, he said, what comes in your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you? And, Lord, I think that's true. Lord, thank you for those who have gone before us. Lord, we stand on the shoulders of, of saints from so long ago some who suffered greatly for what they believed. Lord, may we not take their contribution to what has always been believed. May we not take that lightly. And Lord, may we believe in accordance with this, this orthodox faith that we call Christianity, Lord. Lord, may we be shaped by it. May we think about these things. What do we really believe so that when somebody asks us, we can give it to them? Because, man, it's, it's, it's right there. This is what we believe. This is who we are, and this is why we believe these things. Lord, thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself in these ways that people could write these things down and copy them from the scriptures and put it down into to a concise form that we can declare that we do believe these things. Lord, we believe more than this. But Lord, we sure don't believe much less than this. Thank you. Thank you for creeds, Lord, that summarize your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and we'll sing a closing song. Yeah, it's page 133 in your hymn book.
Where's Tom? Tom, do you have something today? No? Uh, Angie, do you have cookies? Okay. If okay, if you're of the male persuasion, whether you're a father or not, you, you can have cookies as you leave this place. And may you be blessed as you go, believing what the saints have believed for 2,000 years about who God is and what God has done in and through Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. God bless you as you go. If we can pray for you, let us do that. Otherwise, out the door with you.